I guess the bottom line is that um, what it was was a group of people all dedicated to a common purpose who had gone through common experiences, common losses, joining together in a social occasion, which we had done many times before. And um, something happened, horrible happened. I don't, I don't believe, I didn't believe then and I don't believe now that there was ever any intention to do anyone harm, that there was anything untoward happening, that, there, that Edward Kennedy made, there was any malice of forethought or, or uh, if you're using lawyer's terms, uh, um, it just happened, accidents happen. And uh, it was unfortunate for, most of all for her and, uh, and for the rest of us. Um, but it was an accident. And there is no hidden agenda. There is no deep secret. There is no hidden smoking situation. It just happened. And then it was over. So after 25 years, people say, the boiler room girls were committed to secrecy. You know, that nobody has spoken about this from that group for 25 years. Why the secrecy and why have you decided to talk now? We didn't talk about it then because we were um, first traumatized by the event. We had lost a friend. Uh, we were once again um, very vividly reminded of, uh, of everyone's mortality, how fragile life is. We'd gone through, you know, Martin Luther King, Robert Kennedy, then this, um, we were very shattered. The only media, back then, there wasn't a lot of video media, there was a lot of print media. And the first couple forays that people made into attempting to sort of tell the story or, or um, you know, put their position forward um, were very unsuccessful because things were taken out of context and uh, the, what you said was not what was printed. So very early on we we all decided, even be, before there was, there was a legal component, because when the legal component came in that there was going to be an inquest, etc., well then we were witnesses to something and, and obviously we're not meant to be speaking to people. I mean any uh, any lawyer would have told us that. Uh, so we weren't going to speak once that started. But even before that, um, we were so unprotected. We were single women living, living in houses either alone or with roommates. Um, there was print media all over the place. They were on your, your front steps, your back steps. They were at your work. They were at your parents' house. And it was extremely intimidating, and it was so overwhelming that it was just easier to just not say anything just stop because it was painful it wasn't so much that it was secret it was painful it was a very painful ending to a very traumatic period in everybody's life and I think that we all felt we were better served um, to just not talk about it and on reflection now on reflection now, I guess the reason that I've, um, uh, you know, spent a lot of time thinking about whether to do this or not, um, because I had never done it before, is that um, I would like to dispel a couple of the myths that exist. Um, I think it's important for the uh, Mr. and Mrs. Kopechny, since they're in their, their senior years, to have some of this said out loud. It's in books, and people can go to the library, and they can look up books that will say, oh, well, this group was about such and such. But that's different than having one of us come forward and say, um, we knew your daughter. We, she was our friend. We were with her. We loved her. We cared about her. And no one, was, no one of us um, in any way wanted to hurt her or, uh, or have anyone else sully her memory. And it's time someone said that. 
And I guess that's me. Talking about dispelling the myths, one was that the, the group was sort of whisked off the island um, very quickly so that they couldn't be interviewed. Was that in any sense true? I don't think that that's accurate. Um, I know that I called the police station and no one asked me to come in and talk. Nobody asked me to answer any questions. Um, I, I believe that people were informed of where we were and I think people were informed that we were leaving. Uh, I th uh, we, did we want to go? Yes. Um, did we, uh, we want to get back to our families and to some sense of security? Yes. Uh, were we devastated and emotionally upset? And, and uh, yes. And if you put any other five uh, young women in the same circumstance, um, you would get the same reaction. Uh, any of us could have walked off and, uh, you know, given an interview, you know, right after the inquest. Uh, and there was certainly no force brought to bear in any way uh, that we shouldn't do that. Uh, it, it was everyone's individual decision. And our individual decision, I think, that we made individually, but we also made collectively, was that um, this we had done this. It was we had testified what we had said was that people had a chance to ask us what they ever what they wanted to ask us, um, and we had answered truthfully to the best of our ability, and that we wanted to go on with our lives, and we didn't want to talk about it anymore. It was ex it was an extremely painful situation, and it was traumatic, and it um, it destroyed uh, you know the camaraderie between a great group of people. Uh, who would never again be able to assemble in a room and share the same sorts of experiences and memories as they were able to share before that. Um, and for that reason, we just didn't want to talk about it. And we didn't. And never has there been a situation where, uh, you know, someone would call or do, a, you know, uh, Steve Smith never called me and told me not to say anything. Edward Kendi has never called me and told me not to say anything. He has never sent any emissaries to tell me not to say anything. And I'm sure that's true of everyone else. Everyone, you know, rode their own horse and, uh, and uh, tried to grow away from the subject as best they could. One of the assumptions is that something secret happened at the party after the accident that everybody knew what had happened but kept quiet about it and that you were all in it together. That's just not so. As far as, as we know, what has testified, been testified to is what happened. We have no reason to believe that anyone, anything else happened. Um, none of us were there. Uh, we, we were, you know, casual witnesses to uh, a, a, an event that happened out of our sight. And none of us have any reason, at least I have no reason to believe that any of the people that I know uh, know anything different than what they have spoken, yeah, you know, in legal transcripts and, and in any other way. I don't believe that, I don't believe that uh, anyone has told an untruth that I know. And I certainly have no evidence that anyone has. Um, so we all did what, you know, we, we saw it, we called it the way we saw it. As confusing as it was at some point, because life is confusing and people gathered together are confusing. And, and not everything, not everyone sees everything the same. So you never get the same, I mean, any lawyer will tell you that, you know, you never get five witnesses to anything to say the same thing happened at the same time at the same place. It just didn't, that's not the way human nature is. Did you yourselves puzzle after the event as to why the Senator hadn't reported it earlier? I don't want to talk about this. Okay. It's clear that the only person who really knows the facts of the case is Senator Edward Kennedy. He was only the only one there at the time that the car went off the bridge. That's true. So we don't know. 
but I believe that whatever happened happened innocently in terms of people's intentions and I and and I think to say anything else is not to understand um, Mary Jo and what she was about and what and what we were about and what his relationship to us was which which was the younger brother of Robert Kennedy who you know cared enough and went about our loyalty to you know occasionally stop by at these events and that's that's what the relationship was and there was no other relationship between he and Mary Jo or he and the rest of us it was a mutual loyalty and affection period can you tell us about uh, Mary Jo uh, so she had come from the RFK campaign and uh, had worked in legisl as a legislative secretary and was a quiet um, person. I think she really, um, um, many of us uh, blossomed in the boiler room. It was, uh, it was a job of uh, new responsibility. I think she um, believed in, in human rights and um, improving the lots of others and that sort of thing. Um, and, uh, and she, you know, put it into practice. And, uh, she, you know, had done some extraordinary things, gone to Selma for, for um, you know, civil rights marches. I always get upset because I think that, you know, because of what happened, um, there's some effort to have turned her into a saint. Um, and that's, she was a normal, red-butted American girl like all the rest of us. She was hardworking, she was energetic, she was funny, she had a, a wonderful wit. Um, she drove around in a cute little Volkswagen bug. Um, she, she dressed nicely and, and uh, you know, uh, wore short skirts like all the rest of us did at that time. You know, she wasn't a saint. She was a nice, lovely girl um, who was very dedicated to what we were all dedicated to. We were, it, was a, it was a time of great commitment. Um, and it was a time to, that people had to stand tall and take a stand uh, on Vietnam and and on civil rights and on uh, the way we thought you know the country was going and uh, and we were young people that really believed in all that it wasn't you know now it seems uh, all that seems trite because politics has gotten much more cynical but it wasn't trite to us then it was very serious business and she was serious about it could you give us a sense of the the relationships between the men and the women in this group? It would it it would be um, probably not politically correct in the '90s to say that it was very um, paternalistic or fraternal. Um, we were all worked worked very hard, and we worked and we and we played hard. Um, there was not a sense of uh, you know married went, men and single women and uh, any sort of of uh, relationship that was uh, of any sexual nature between any of of these people. It was a family and it was a very large uh, encompassing family. The, the campaign was a family but this was a this was a very close knit section of the family. Um, and there was a responsibility that people felt to, towards one another. Uh, I was um, the youngest member of Robert Kennedy's staff. I was the youngest member of the boiler room. I was probably, uh, except for college volunteers, probably the youngest member of the the uh, the campaign established staff. Um, no man from the beginning to the end um, ever did anything untoward, said anything untoward, made uh, you know uh, a sexual innuendo, what we would call in the 90s sexual harassment. It didn't exist in the 1968 campaign. It just didn't exist. Um, I, I, I would sit in, in meetings with, you know, very hard-boiled, tough guys who were, you know, trial lawyers who do not necessarily have the, the, the sweetest of tongues. Um, and I never heard uh, obscenities. They didn't speak that way when there were women in the room. It, there was a, it was a different time. There were different values back then. So that um, that whole myth of this uh, single 
bunch of single girls being sort of served up to uh, married men for some other purpose just didn't happen. It didn't happen. And it, it wasn't what it was about. And the relationships were not that way. So there was, you never had a feeling of concern about going somewhere. I, I, I went to Salt Lake City with Senator Edward Kennedy and Don Gifford and I, just the three of us together. And never felt threatened or concerned and, you know, my mother didn't worry. <laughs> you know, and my sister didn't worry. No one worried. And that's the way it was. And that's why it was so, uh, uh, you know, very difficult when, the, you know, the, the, the event occurred and, and the, the accident happened. When all of this, this came down, a, a totally different picture. Um, it, we were hard put to know how to deal with it because it was out of our ken. And it was so clear to all the Kennedy people, they all understood it. I mean, they knew that this is not what this was. But I'm not sure that the public ever really understood it the way it, the way it really was. And, and that's unfortunate. And I think that that's, that has really hurt the Kopechnies in, in a major way, and it's one of the reasons that I feel a responsibility to talk about it now, because they're in their senior years, and they should have that put to rest, um, that this is not what this group, group of people was about. This is not what Mary Jo Kopechny was about, and certainly was not what Edward Kennedy was about on that night. We haven't really mentioned Robert Kennedy, um, what he represented to you, uh, working in the boiler room for him. Uh, can you want to tell us well, about Well, uh, he was everything. Start again. Um, yeah. That, this okay. is going to be the hard part. Right. Um, Robert Kennedy was it all to us. I mean, and he still is. Uh, he epitomized to us, uh, you know, where we wanted the country to go and taking a stand on things and, uh, you know, caring about other people and making the United States into a different place than it was before. Uh, you know, the, the new generation of Americans, that whole, that whole um, ball of wax. We, uh, you know, to work for him was uh, considered, was a great honor. And he was a, a complicated, uh, interesting guy. You know, um, besides, you know, all the things that he represented to the country, he was just a fascinating man to have contact with. Uh, he was a, a terrific father, and uh, he was uh, very uh, much shyer than um, people often portray him. I mean, in in uh, in groups, he was not uh, a shining, you know, light always. Um, he would often stand back and and be more interested in 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 the conversation with one person rather than with a whole bunch. Particularly if he was wanting to learn about someone. And he, and he when, once he was exposed to something, he wanted to learn it and know about it. Um, and, and because of that, because of the kind of mind he had and the kind of person that he was, he was an incredibly inspiring person to work for. Uh, because you knew that whatever he, he was constantly changing, whatever he was that day, he was going to be even more the next day. And when you think back that, uh, that he died at 42, um, we have, you know, really no way of knowing how much more he would have grown um, between then and now. We really do believe that it would have been a different world had he not died. And when Nixon came in, um, it was the end of a lot of stuff in this country, a lot of very forward-moving social um, agendas were left by the wayside. When he died, um, can you tell us about the impact of his death on you? It was uh, devastating. Uh, there's not a word that really devastating doesn't cover it. We were. We were young, we were involved, it was an intense time, the campaign was only 85 days long. We lived, breathed, ate, worked, played, campaigned, that's all we did. And 
and he was the major presence in that, even though I, I believe that he only actually physically walked into the boiler room once, and maybe even into the national campaign headquarters once, because he was always on the road, because we were so late. There really wasn't time to kind of sit around and contemplate things. He was out winning primaries. Um, and so when he was sh uh, shot, it was uh, the end of it all. I mean, there were people who um, just not only emotionally, but just terrifically, physically devastated, uh, you know, who had heart attacks, people who, who um, you know, almost died when he died. Uh, it was um, it was very intense, and for those of us who were very young, um, it was harder because we were looking at these older people who we uh, you know respected and had held in such esteem. We're going through it the second time. Uh, to to look at Kenny O'Donnell after Robert Kennedy died was um, to look at the walking wounded. It was you could you couldn't look at these people without being upset, more upset than you were, if that was possible. So it was it was um, very, very very intense experience. Um, I think for the entire country, but for us it was uh, horrible. So. Um, and in, in the the weeks afterwards, how would you how would you describe your your sense of yourself and uh, the, gr the group? Well, I think we all, um, I mean, I don't think anyone did anything terribly um, rational for two years after that. I mean, um, everyone was sort of walked around in some sort of a half stupor coma. Um, you know, you just sort of went through the motions. Uh, we, we had to, we had to close up the campaign headquarters. We had to Finish that job. We had to uh, the Senate staff, Senate office had to be emptied, which was you know uh, emotionally just horrible to think about. You know, hanging somebody else's name on the door. Um, so it was all very intense. And what happened was people tended to do their job, work through it, um, interact in in very professional ways because your attitude was, who am I to cry or be up? You know. It was very Irish, you know. I, I, um, you know, uh, Irish people don't um, show their emotions very well, well, and they don't cry. You know, they have the reason they have Irish wakes is because they're laughing, so they won't cry. Um, and that's the way um, it was. I mean, people did their job, went home, and cried by themselves. Leading on from uh, the assassination of Robert Kennedy. In that period afterwards, there was some coming together of the, the Boiler Room group at different events, wasn't there? Could you like right. to tell us about I think that, I think to be truthful that there were probably many co comings together of many different groups. But we, we are a very small group. I mean, it's similar. Um, there was a lot of healing pr things going on with throughout this group of people who had been so involved in the campaign, the press. People, people who had been on the train or, or the road show, as it was called. Um, but our group was very small, and 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 so our um, our meetings could be accommodated in in you know quite easily because we were there were only twelve of us or so. And after the sender died, the first one was in July, very early July, only a month after he died. Um, we were all. Uh, kind of shutting up the campaign and cut and tur and closing up the office and things were very emotionally uh, um, heavy and people were quite worked up and exhausted and etc and uh, we were invited Senator Ted Kennedy had had leased it that summer a beautiful yacht um, primarily to have a place to take all these uh, mourning children of which there were many um, and have a diversion and be able to take short sailing trips uh, up and down the the coast and it was a lovely it was a lovely boat and that for some reason it was not being used that weekend so we it was agreed that we would all go uh, um, up for the weekend and and we did and it uh, included all eight of the 
Boiler Room Girls were there. Um, and we uh, were joined there by some advanced men, most of whom we knew, um, who had been out of the Robert Kennedy campaign and, get, and very devoted R Robert Kennedy operatives. And we, uh, we arrived and we had a lovely, uh, a lovely cocktail party uh, was hosted for us at Joan, by Joan Kennedy, um, whom we all knew and, uh, well and she knew us. Uh, and uh, Edward Kennedy was not on the compound that weekend. He was away somewhere. We, uh, we had a lovely sail over. Um, it was, uh, you know, it was beautiful and sunny and nice. You know, it was a great respite from everything else that was going on. So the, the party on Chappaquiddick um, was part of this? Series of parties. Yeah. The, the, the final party, uh, you know, at the Edgerton Regatta, um, time um, was the end of a series of three or four parties. Um, <clears throat> but in all these occasions, uh, Robert Kennedy was a very large presence in the, in, in the room or in the place. I mean, that, the, the joining together was about him and about, you know, what we had all been through. So it was a great um, chance to sort of tell old stories and sort of heal yourself and, heal, and uh, you know, laugh and cry and do all the things that friends do in, in times like that. 